Stein, and this is, I don't know, I've got to find another way to say it, but I haven't found one, another episode of The Facts. And um, I'm sitting here tonight, we're talking about drugs, the war on drugs, the civilization that we live in, uh, and I'm talking, this gentleman right here is Tony Newman, he's the Director of Media Relations at the Drug Policy Alliance, and the gentleman across the table from me is George Brandon. He's a professor of community health and social medicine at the Sophie Davis School, which is at City College, and that's part of the City College, uh, City University of New York. And, um, you know, you had said to me, you had said the thing about only good people use drugs, and, and but everybody is, you know, so many people, not everybody, I guess, but, uh, you know. I well, it's, it's actually, a, it's a campaign that was launched uh, by some friends in the UK. It's called Nice People Take Drugs. And the thing is, the reason they did it was to kind of challenge people's stereotype. I think when most people think of a drug user, you think of, uh, you know, someone who's panhandling on the street or some, you know, some kind of bad person. But they remind us, nice people use drugs. I mean, think. Almost, I'm sure all of our viewers are have using some drug or the other, coffee, cigarettes, weed, Prozac, Viagra, Ritalin, Coke, weed, you know, so there's, everyone's using drugs. And the, you know, the other funny thing is like, when you say nice people use drugs, it's also like challenging the stereotype, you know, so many times, oh, pe the, the stereotype around drugs is either you're a lazy couch potato stoner eating Doritos, right? Or you're out, you know, finding your fix, all this stuff, but think, the, pres the last three presidents of the United States all were all drug users. Obama said not only did he smoke weed, he, uh, he tried coke when he, when he could afford it. President Bush would never answer his youthful <laughs> indiscretions. My youthful indiscretions when I was 40. Uh, you know, so, I mean, you know, Bill Clinton had his uh, famous answer, you know, I, I inhaled, but I, I smoked, but I didn't inhale it. But, you know, the point is, many successful people, from Michael Phelps and the athletes to leading scientists, Carl Sagan, to presidents, to elected officials. You can't even find an elected official now who says they haven't tried marijuana. And so the point is that, you know, people around our society do take drugs, but the stereotype, the image, and who's getting punished and incarcerated uh, is mostly poor people, poor African Americans, Latinos, or ones filling our, ce our, our jail cells because of their drug use. Uh, and, you know, that's, that's something we all have to think about. I want all of us to, who are watching this show Think about what drugs either do you use, someone in your family use, and would anyone want them or their family members to be locked in a cage because they have a drug problem? I mean, what you know? I mean, one of the things that what 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 is a drug? I mean, how how can you how can you have that glass of wine and 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 not understand what a drug is, not understand what the effect of a drug is. I mean, you you know what the effect of a drug is. How can you have that bite? Well, chocolate's not a drug, right? No. Okay. Um, all right. Truck is not a drug. It contains a drug. Yeah. It contains a drug. It contains caffeine. Sizable amounts of it. Because it certainly does make me feel better. <laughs> so, so uh, and the sugar. <laughs> and the sugar. Okay. You were talking about drugs. Drugs becoming personalized. No, I mean this is uh, becoming a, a major selling point for drug research, and it relates back to genetics. What physicians would really like to be able to do is to uh, sort of narrow the uh, possible responses that people have to drugs. You, you prescribe a, a painkiller. Okay. Some people, a painkiller works. Some people, it doesn't work. Mm -hmm. okay. Some people, it, you have to give it at higher dosages than, than others. Okay. But you only know this after the fact, after you, after you have prescribe the drug. I mean, particularly in the case where a drug doesn't work, you know, that there may be some, some price after you stop taking it. This is a case I had with, uh, I was taking Cymbalta. I was taking Cymbalta for a neuropathy, which is tingling and loss of sensation in your extremities, like your fingers or your, mm -hmm. or your feet. So I was taking Cymbalta for that. Cymb Cymbalta used to be used, well, still being used to treat depression. So you sort of taper into using Cymbalta. You, know, you take a one, one, one a couple of days, and you take it twice a day, 
and then you build up to a dose that you're going to be maintained on for a while. And in my case, I had to stop taking it because it wasn't doing anything for my neuropathy. You come off of it, and the very common thing to happen after you've stopped taking it is you get severely depressed. Now, if you were able to know in advance, first of all, whether the drug would work, and then if you were able to know in advance that the, that the person would not go into a severe depression afterwards, wouldn't you like that? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because you can only do that on the, pay, on the basis of the individual you are prescribing it to. I mean, if you could find a drug that you could be sure on the basis of particularly of genetic information that you could get on the person, mm. that it would have a particular effect, you could match the genetics to the actual tailoring of the drug, then the effect would be a personalized drug, which you could give to the person knowing that you know, it would have the intended effect and a minimum of side effects. So that so that that's a goal, you know, for drug developers and, and, and physicians. You know, it's 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 a it's a selling point to raise money to go in this direction. I see, I see, I see. Um, so, how do drugs relieve stress? Those drugs that relieve stress, how do they relieve stress? Well, there's a couple of different ways. One is they're actually affecting the, um, the balance of, of neurotransmitters in, in, in the brain. You know, so that's in effect sort of begins, it modulates them. And you can do it a couple of different ways. One is by, uh, there are a number of neurotransmitters that go through a cycle, and then you can intervene in the cycle so that they don't get taken back again and recycled. You, 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 then you can modulate the way that the body's responding. You can, you can do it by simply inhibiting the stress response, which, you, which was, stress response is fairly nonspecific. Anything could provoke it. So you can sort of block that stress? In, is yeah, that yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, and, you, and you can do that by, you know, by manipulating these neurotransmitters or intervening at particular points in, this, in the stress response. There's an area of the brain called the hypothalamus, which a lot of us is regulated by by the, uh, through the hypothalamus to um, adrenal, adrenal glands. Adrenal glands is basically what, what sets you off. You know, the adrenaline is a source of energy that activates the stress response, which is basically, it's a, it's a fight or flight response. It's a response to immediate danger. Uh -huh. So if you can block that happening, then you block the entire stress response. So that, that's one way you can do it. Another way is you can do it, but basically the way alcohol does it, which is by you know, having it work as an uh, area that de depresses activity in the back part of the brain. But, uh, alcohol is a back brain depressor. You mean depressive, it literally like sits on it or something? No, if you can imagine, for example, you have, say you have uh, a, a container, it's got lots of sparks going through it. You know, if you can do anything that lessens the activity that's in there, lessens the degree of, of, of stimulation, and then you, in fact, are you know, depressing the activity that's there. The psychological aspect of, a, of it you know, is once you get to a certain level of, of, of that loss of activity and loss of, of stimulation. But you can have it without that. You know, so what, what you actually are doing is you know, lessening the, the stimulation. And in fact, one of the things people often forget is that aside from you know, controlling stuff that goes in to your brain, the brain also depends on feedback. So if you can interfere with the feedback loop, you can actually begin to shut down certain kinds of activities going on in your brain. And something like alcohol does that. You know, I, I, I've had this, uh, you don't know what I'm gonna tell you. I had, I've had this, uh, this uh, idea for a long time with, 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 uh, with alcohol or weed that, that um, I, I, it's been a long time since I've used these substances, but uh, well, at least certainly weed. Uh, that uh, that it, I used to like to write music on it, or because I thought what it did was that it limited the contradictions that I was that I was feeling. It it it, it allowed me to focus because I actually didn't feel as much, and yeah, that was okay. that was that was the that was the pleasure, and that was why I could you know it, 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 what I wrote wasn't necessarily. In, in fact, any better, maybe worse, mm -hmm. under the influence. Mm -hmm. But it it 
it, it, it leveled the playing field for me, or however, you know, just what I said. And so it's interesting that you say that, because that's what it feels like, that it's, it's, it's you're not, you, and many people, it's often described in, in drug mythology, you know, that you're feeling so much more, that you're so much mm -hmm. more awake. And I thought that was very strange, because it seems to me I'm feeling less, you know, I'm happy to feel less. <laughs> I don't want to feel more, but um, I'm not feeling more. Yeah, I mean, that's literally what's happening. I mean, you, the other thing that goes along with that is the way that it sort of releases inhibitions and, you know, in the judging aspect of what's happening. Mm -hmm. You know, so, so f on, 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 that, on that grounds, it feels sort of liberating. Mm -hmm. You know, because the inhibitions are lower, but also the judgment isn't as good either. So if you're if you're using it as a means to deal with uh, distress or anxiety, it works for that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, it does. But with uh, a deficit in, in, in judgment and also a lessening of inhibitions, which you may want. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but also there's you know the you know the um, the depression, very light, but means there's less stimulation. Well, it, it, in this, it, and, and maybe I'm all wrong on this, so you guys could hit me. Um, in this drug of choice thing, for instance, when I think about the, the rage of methamphetamines in the Midwest and in the West, as opposed to Eastern cities, well, I don't know what's happening now, where it was, certainly it's Coke, which is still the same kind of thing, right? Or the difference between a, a heroin epidemic is it is it is it the is it simply you know that that it's 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 more available in some places or is there you know one drug that kind of makes you logy and one drug that makes you you know speed down the road or is it that it's uh, something about <laughs> the situation or the that makes one a drug of choice and one not a drug of choice. Mm -hmm. uh, in 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 the individual or in a particular environment, a particular mm -hmm. setting, mm -hmm. is there any yeah, evidence? Yeah, you know, it's 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 an interesting question. I mean, I think um, you know, I've been at the drug policy alliance now eleven years, and and you do see these kind of cycles of new drugs and new. You know, I remember when I was uh, a number of years ago, it was the ecstasy. Ecstasy was mm -hmm. everywhere, and it was like you know, it was the cover of all the magazines, and this is the new thing. And then, you know, again, not, none of these drugs ever go away, but, you know, there's just kind of like these cycles. And then in meth now is a huge thing, and meth is everywhere. And, and, uh, and, and so, I mean, there's a, a few things to think about. One is, is the way the media talks about a lot of these things. The media can get very hyped up and, and, and almost, here, here's, a, here's, an exa here's a funny example. There's this stuff like K2, you know, alternative, you say, uh, Marijuana is illegal, right? So chemists and stuff figure out how to make something that has marijuana-like effects, mm -hmm. but uh, it's not illegal. So because marijuana is illegal, we drive people to do even unhealthier kind of chemical stuff because of our, you know, it's the, it's the result of prohibition. So now we're driving people to drive, but no one is, you know, no one's doing it. So then the media gets hyped on something. The K2 is everywhere, and your kids are going to be doing this and at the stores. And it's amazing, they, they turn something that, no, salvia, these drugs that no one has ever tried before, and you, you, these, the media thing kind of hypes it up, so for the first time, you know, so is the, was there a lot of ecstasy used in the, in the uh, you know, in the early 2000s? You know, in certain communities, yes. Uh, it, you know, it, the media that hypes up a lot of this stuff, is there some media kind of fuel that makes it seem like it's everywhere and stuff? Yes, and then this, some of it cycles out naturally. Just you know, think things like almost like fads. Things come and go and stuff. But what it doesn't is what it's not related to, is like amped up new laws. You know, it's like these laws that kind of come and we're gonna like crack down and do that stuff. That actually is not what influences drug use. There's more of these natural cycles. But what happens is once these kind of laws get locked in, they can have consequences uh, for for many decades. You know when. When they made the first mandatory minimum laws, it was in response to Len Bias, the famous basketball player. He, he died at the age of 22, mm -hmm. right before he joined the Boston Celtics. It was in the 80s. That's when everyone said, we're going to make these laws, these crack cocaine laws, five you know grams of crack, we're going to give you automatic. He died of, cra of, of overdose of the, crack. The irony is actually it was actually cocaine and alcohol, mm -hmm. but they the, the way it all came out was this was like the crack epidemic. 
We have to get tough. We're going to make five grams, which is like two sugar packets of, of crack cocaine, uh, equal to you get a, a mandatory five years in prison. So even though cocaine and crack cocaine are, are the similar drugs, we, we had these laws because of this, the hype and the media and the crack babies and all this stuff. And then it took 30 years. We finally changed. Uh, uh, President Obama just signed a small reform last year. So, like, what happens is the media can, can hype up things, and the politicians, we have to take care of this, and ecstasy, and we have to go after the meth, and we have to go to the guy, and this. And then as things change and we learn more information, mm -hmm. it turns out all this stuff about the crack babies, you know what it turns out? That, that, was, that was a media myth. There, there, if, some, if someone either drinks, a mother who drinks alcohol or even who just lives in poverty, something you can't even tell the difference between that baby and a crack baby thing. But the media thing was so strong. and, really? and Yes, so strong. And you can look this up. But the media hysteria gets so strong that we pass these laws that it takes 30 years to undo. So, uh, you know, again, I'm not saying that there's not harms from methamphetamine. I'm not saying, you know, we want anyone to go do crack. But uh, you know the the, the unscientific uh, you know explanations that and, and hysteria that can get whipped up in the media uh, lead, can lead to elected officials making these laws that take decades to undo. And there is a, another aspect to the whole drug of choice question, and well, there's a couple of assumptions you know seemingly built into the question. Uh -huh. One yeah. is that there's a choice. You know, and Sometimes when you see sort of a, a sort of a switch that occurs, it's because something that people are usually taking are no longer available, and mm. the people that they get it from have something else to sell now. Mm. I see. You know, that happens. Mm -hmm. You know, so you have that kind of situation. And then, of course, there are people who, you know, who, who actually do have a choice, and they prefer some drugs over others. <laughs> mm -hmm. You know, it's sort of an aesthetically experiential thing for them. And depending on what their preference is, they may have to go through a lot to get that. <laughs> and go through a lot to get that. Mm -hmm. Particularly if it's something that's not readily available. But I was in, oh, I was in black community in Baltimore in the, in the early 80s, in Newark in the 70s. And you know, there were some things that you just couldn't get. You know, if I wanted to get mescaline in Newark, I couldn't get mescaline. I couldn't get it. Nobody was using it. Nobody was selling it. You know, I could I could get heroin very easily. Mm. To snort a few up, mm -hmm. I could get easy because a lot of people were selling it. In the beginning of the eighties, mm. when crack was coming in, because it came in gradually in in, in Newark and in, in Baltimore. But once it got in there, it was it was a thing. <laughs> it was really explosive. Yeah, and I was there. The kind of drugs like the sort of party drugs, that wasn't happening in. in yeah. So part of it is like what is actually uh, available to you mm -hmm. and how it gets to you. you know, aside from whatever your pr preference is, you know, there was a definite divide between people who were into heroin and people who were into cocaine because cocaine is a stimulant uh, and, and heroin isn't. Right. You know, we talk about, you know, you talk about the same drug, right? And we think about meth, right? And you have an image and like you said, uh, you know, it's all these people in the Midwest and they're all strung out, right? At the same time, Ritalin, is on every college campus in, in this country. You have students who stay up and they, they take Ritalin to help them with their studying. And so it's, it's another interesting question of like, you know, they're both speed, right? Is mm -hmm. it a Ritalin mm -hmm. and, and, and that, you know, straight A honor students are taking, they're taking Ritalin and someone else is taking meth, but we, we can have such a different right. image of, of what that, who that person is or, you know, someone can take a, a, you know, a legal sleeping pill every night, you know, to go to bed. And someone who doesn't have a prescription or happens to their sleeping pill happens to come from the street illegally, and, we, and they're considered a drug addict. Mm -hmm. You know, so it's again, it's so much of, of um, you know, thinking through. Again, it's back to that thing: is what is a drug? What is our image of it? You know, can people have different relationships to these drugs? People can use it in a healthy way. It's considered a healthy. You know, like you said, you were saying earlier about pain, right? That's that's a sister drug to, to heroin, right? Because OxyContin mm -hmm. is a sister, right? So someone's yeah, thinking that. And, and, and here, here's another. Legally addicted. <laughs> and here's an, here's an interesting thing. Now more people are dying from these prescription pills, right, than the overdose have been from heroin, right? Mm -hmm. So we know how dangerous they are. But another thing is that because doctors now, there's been a lot of hysteria about doctors and giving out pills and mm -hmm. all that kind of stuff. So now a lot of doctors are afraid to give. Uh, 
OxyContin or pain mm -hmm. medication because they, they're afraid they're going to get busted. They, they, yeah. you know, so, there's, so it's like, so there's all these different effects. Not only is it a serious drug, can people abuse it, can people mm -hmm. die? Yes. Are doc is it also a valuable drug for people in pain and can it be very helpful to people? Yes. Are people under prescribing it, some doctors, because they're afraid of the, the consequences, all this stuff? Yeah. So, so all these things, it's very, very complicated. And, and, and I think what happens in our society, though, is we say these simple, just say no, mandatory minimum laws, three strikes, you're out. We set up these rigid things that don't take in the complexity of the, the joy, the pain, the benefits, the harms. And I think a lot of it needs to come down to education. You know, one is is not is a little less judgment of, of, of who a drug person is, or you know, oh, they use drugs. A little less judgment on that. I think it's obvious that there's drugs all around us, and people are doing this. And there has to be education. If you if you think about like with with young people when you're in high school, there's alcohol. You know, half the kids are going to try marijuana before they graduate. Twenty five years after Nancy Reagan, mm -hmm. just say no, right? Twenty five percent. I mean, fifty percent are going to try marijuana before they graduate. 75% are gonna try alcohol. You know what? You know how we educate kids about uh, drug use? We tell them to just say no. That doesn't, right? So I mean, if we're, if we're talking about education, we need to tell kids, hey, you know what? Make sure you don't drink and drive. You know, you, we, if, yeah, you don't, maybe we don't want you to drink, but definitely don't get behind the wheel of a car. So we need to, you know, about marijuana, you know, don't, uh, make sure you don't, you know, I mean, there's, th there's ways to educate people. You know, the thing, and the other thing is, when we tell people just say no, and, and, they, and we, we make up lies like, oh, if you smoke marijuana, you become a heroin addict. It's all a gateway thing. Then you know what young people say? We're not going to, you have no credibility with me. You said marijuana is going to turn me into a heroin addict or I'm going to be, you know, stupid. And I've actually, my buddy smokes or I smoke and we see that it's not what you said is going to mm -hmm. happen. It's going to happen. So how do we know meth is as bad as you tell me? How do we know that? Mm -hmm. So we, if we lose our credibility, we need honesty with our young people and with ourselves of what these drugs, because if, 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 if we lose our credibility by, by with hysteria and fear and telling people, then when we really need people to don't take meth, don't don't mm -hmm. try crack, it, it, we lose our credibility if we said all along lies about uh, yeah. other things. It seems like a, it, it, it'd be a dramatic uh, political change. I mean, the drugs, the war on drugs, the, the, the whole discussion about drugs has been used to to to. Uh, to, to lay out, you know, the what's what, and this is this, and this is that about the whole society. I mean, this is one of the, one of the. I mean, the the, the it's 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 the, the, this coats of ignorance, the the that that we can't that so many things that we can't talk about that are involved with drugs. The it's it's like the it's like you, you can't talk about sex to those kids, and that population of kids is going to get pregnant much faster than you know, going to get STDs much faster than the other kids who were hip, you know, to to um, we're in the last four minutes of our discussion, um, so uh, uh, so solutions to uh, and you know I mean uh, something very straightforward like the crack versus cocaine the the the, t the amount of time that's given the population that's being targeted mm -hmm. the the re I mean this you know all these advertising people are taking cocaine and and it's it's okay it's kind of whatever but uh, it, it's terrible when these other, you know, so so it. I, I guess what I'm saying is that it's, this, it 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 really could help move this, you know, uh, identifying the the class structure, talking about the class structure, uh, um, and maybe moving it, you know, but certainly moving the conversation into a more serious place, and into into a more truthful place uh, to to open the door to discussions about drugs and um, to really open the door to discussions about drugs, which is, it seems that the, the door is going to be forced open anyway, right? You know, one, one thing about the solutions I want to mm -hmm. say, you know, there's a lot happening overseas that Americans don't even know mm -hmm. about. Portugal is a country that nine years ago decriminalized all drugs. You cannot get arrested. If you have less than 10 days worth of use of heroin, cocaine, anything, you will not go to jail. Americans don't even know about this, but you know what happened since they decriminalized it? Reduction in HIV, reduction in overdose deaths, less uh, incarcerated. I mean, there's been all these benefits that have happened because they treat it as a health issue. When someone gets busted, they sit down, they, they see what's going on with them, but they take away the incarceration, they take away this kind of mm -hmm. fear and some of the stigma. A lot of countries right now are doing this thing called safe injection sites, right? If people are ejecting anywhere, instead of doing it on a, in an alley or a mm -hmm. street corner, do it in front of a doctor in a, in a clean place where they can get their thing mm -hmm. and they don't overdose, they're not using a dirty needle. 
there are creative ways that p things that countries are doing that are, 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 and I think when you talk about solutions, we need this to be a health issue. We need to remove the, the guns, the tanks, and the bars, and we need the doctors and the hospitals, and we need, we need this to be a health issue. But the last thing I'll say before I, I turn it over to both of you is that, you know, we need viewer, we need people to, the war on drugs is not gonna end itself. There is powerful interest in this, and we need people who realize this is crazy, the $40 billion a year we're spending on the war on drugs and locking up people. We need people to get involved. They should go to drugpolicy.org, where I work. I work with the Drug Policy Alliance. We need, uh, the only thing that's gonna end this war is it's gonna be a movement of people. And if the people lead, the leaders will follow, but it's not gonna happen on its own. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, so, listen, uh, uh, let's, let's uh, we're in the last two minutes. We've got maybe 90 seconds, 90 little itsy fritzy seconds to go. Um, and we've, we, uh, so the, any ideas about uh, in in the in the last closing minute about about what else you know s specific ideas that what people what we can do to if we can you know or what it's going to look like a hundred years from now or a hundred and ten years from now or something when the when the war on drugs is over is it going to be over then? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> what, what is I it? Sure, look I certainly like? hope so. <laughs> <laughs> I certainly hope so. Okay, here we and go. Without, we you know, it would be a, a, a transition. The first part of the transition that I see is from viewing, uh, well, let's look specifically at elite addictive drugs as opposed to all the other ones. Okay? The most serious thing there would be to stop viewing drug addiction as a, as, as a state of criminality mm -hmm. and to view it instead as a, a, a medical problem, you know, which is treatable but which also has a variety of components to it. You know, so you just go back to why some people are using drugs that addict them <laughs> in the first place. You know, so there's a psychological aspect to this, and, and also a, a social one because of the way that people's social position, what race they are, who their ancestors were, what they look like, how, how those things impact on them to the point where they would have access to and then actually go out and purchase drugs that addict them. We've got nine seconds. <laughs> I, I want to thank both of you for, for joining us on The Facts tonight. Thank you, Tony. Thank, thank you, George. You. It's been welcome. a real pleasure. Good night.